Well, the U.S. Congress doesn't change even with population. That should change. We're at. Um, well, I, I, I'm not arguing whether yeah. it should. I'm just saying yeah. it's a state step. Yeah. No, the con- stable number. That, that's set by their rules, and it would be against their interest to dilute themselves in power. <laughs> so. You got part of the baby. With the one problem. rep and two senators, the rep has more power than two senators. Yeah. In Alaska. In Alaska, too. Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, Portland, South Dakota. That's, but I think that that's laid out. I don't, I don't think we've changed from, you know, two senators yeah. per area, and we changed the legislative lines to accommodate the growth. If we wanted more legislative seats, that's where I think you'd have to change the constitution. Yeah, and then the legislature controls that, and it would not be in their interest to do so. Well, I don't know if it's that. I mean, I, I'm speaking for myself now, having been a legislator. Sure. I think that, I think that there's lots of legislators that, at a certain point in time, you know, went from under 100,000 per district, as long as I was there, to over 125,000 per district, and now more. You know, it is that that's a lot of people to represent. Obviously, not as much as a congressional district, but where people expect their local state elected officials to have more contact with them because we're here most of the time. You know, it does get difficult, but that's something you probably should bring up with your state representatives. And I don't know whether they have a problem with it or not. I know it's very hard to change the Constitution. Yeah. And they made it that way purposely because <laughs> they don't want it changed all the time. Two on the ballot this time around. Okay, Mr. Crawford? Back to council uh, districts. Um, this is a process question for uh, Deputy Auditor uh, Adelstein, although I don't know if she knows the answer. And that is, uh, yeah, the council ratifies, doesn't change, it ratifies this through an ordinance. But, any, and I'm, I'm pretty ambivalent about the change, and I, I would assume most of the council members were. But let's say there was, in the coming weeks, some controversy about this. And four council members did not support this plan and we're unwilling to vote for the ordinance. What would, do you know what would happen procedurally at that point? Does it go back to the committee, or is there some penalty for missing some sort of deadline? What, what would happen? Or, or Kelly seems to know. I was gonna say, I think, that I spoke yesterday with Dana Brown Davis, um, who is the council clerk, and she was the one who clarified to me that the, the commission, or the committee, has presented it, and the, except for uh, adopting the parameters of the boundaries, that the council does to put into code, there isn't um, any um, opportunity for the council to change those. Where the council will have some feedback and will have some back and forth eyes on the creation of the precincts, um, because those do have to be um, adopted by the council, and the council can have some feedback and some back and forth with sending it back to the auditor's office if you don't like the precincts you're created. Let me restate my question. If the council were not to pass an ordinance, Adopting the adopting uh, this, what would happen? Well, I, I think the last that I was looking on the uh, council ordinance um, at the uh, that was used ten years ago, and when they submitted those uh, guidelines, the council asked some questions and sent it back to the commission, the committee, and the committee looked at it and said, "No, we liked what we had, and that was it." Yeah. I'll ask the question one more time. <laughs> if the council refuses to pass, let's say this became some big country. I'm just being so hypothetical because it's not going to happen. But then what stop. would happen? Then, yeah, then why are you asking me? <laughs> well, I want to know all of the hypothetical options here uh, because I think it's important for the process. Does it go to a judge? Does it? What, what well, quite honestly, I will be fair and give you a straight answer, which is I don't know the exact answer to that hypothetical that you think will never happen. <laughs> well, that said, I think it will pass 7-0. I don't yeah. think it will be but I'm but just I, curious. Yeah, no, I, I, I would be certainly um, uh, well, w- willing to uh, get that information for you and get it to you. Okay. But get if they can't the change it, why? what's the point? If they can't. Well, we, we possibly What's the point could. Of even passing I, I'm just saying, and this is totally non <laughs> but I'm just saying, if it wasn't acceptable, you know, let, let's say that the, the, God bless the Republicans and the Democrats, but let's say they've appointed a bunch of yahoos to this committee and they came up with the goofiest plan that, that on the face of it, all of us sitting here just said, you know, you guys are out to like that 39th district. Like, I like think we, some most of, of us agree that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, 
are you saying that the, these, uh, not you guys, but these goofballs control the process and the council can't change it? I would think that the check and balance here is that the council could say, well, we can't change your, your suggestion, but we can sure vote no on it. And, and that's what I'm wondering, well, what would the next step be? Yeah, uh, and I apologize for not knowing that, not having thought that. Uh, but we can certainly get that information and maybe include it in Whatcom for Fair Voting's uh, bulletin that you put out to your membership as well. So it isn't just Sam getting the answer. Go ahead, Don. Section 4.42, the districting plan. The districting master Excuse me, Don, what are you reading? The charter or the state law? The charter. Uh, you've got to tell us what you're reading before you read it. Is this charter or state law? Well, this is the Whatcom County Charter that the council has to follow. And it says that the district committee shall adopt the districting plan within 15 days upon adoption. The districting plan shall be filed with the county auditor by the districting committee. The plan shall become effective immediately upon filing. And does the charter address any role for the council? Or the appointing the committee in section 4.41. There's copies of it right here. So the question is, why is it required to this? Yeah, right, exactly. To adopt the boundaries into the county code. You don't... So it's more of a making the county code Match sync what? that. Mm -hmm. So it's not an authority thing. It's right. simply What it's we would be knowledge. doing is we would be not acknowledging that the county code needs to accept. I see what you're saying. So the other yeah, that was the district of the, the, okay. adopting the boundaries. That was what I had Interesting. And we would have a code that's out of sync. But I think that what, what Don said is important because sometimes your authority, as it is when the governor appoints certain commission members, your authority is in who you appoint to make your, you've delegated your authority to us so by saying we're, we're okay. Yahoos, we would blame you. Yeah, we so would blame you. <laughs> so, so the Yahoo thing would have been, I think we had to, we had to pass a resolution you did. authorizing yes. you guys after the, so that would have been the check and balance to yep. say, uh oh, they're Yahoos, Yahoo. we don't want to. Okay. What a is wonderful it? civics lesson this is. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Kelly, it's probably a question for you, given your experience. But what, what's your sense or insight as to the as to the political process that goes on at the state and the, and the, uh, the state boundaries, and the congressional boundaries? Well, it, it was interesting because ten years ago, when we went through redistricting, I really didn't pay a whole lot of attention. I mean, I'm just blithely going along, being a legislator, and basically, the 42nd district was the last district decided. And I and the the swing of the district was decidedly more conservative because the people that were more influential in that process in the caucuses were Harriet Spinell and Jeff Morris and Dave Qual. They were in safe Democratic districts, and usually, in the end, the redistricting committee figures out. Not always, but. They're influenced by who is in the legislature at the time and in consolidating their their safe districts. And that's what's happened uh, it just all across the country and all across the state. My personal opinion in this is if we tried to create districts, especially legislative districts, that had, um, they say we should have communities of interest, but that's about the last thing that's really looked at when it, you know when the final decision gets made. If we really wanted to have basically bell-shaped curve districts, not that necessarily weren't more Democratic or more Republican, but more not like Block or 42nd district that's a U-shaped district that's so polarized, then we'd probably get more examples of what we did because Charlie Crabtree and I, you know, oh, well, I guess I'd use Hugh as a better example. You know, Carl, Charlie Tra Crabtree and Hugh have been activists in their parties for a long time and don't agree on a lot of things, but we could agree on this when we had some clear goals. Um, I, when I talked to the redistricting people because they thought, gee, she just lost her election, we'll come and ask her what she thinks. I said it would be nice to have, I said for, for at least 20 years or maybe longer, Bellingham has not really been a community of interest. The 42nd district has felt kind of nobody, it, there's no Democrats that live in Bellingham in the 42nd district, which is all the biggest population center. And I said, why don't we consider, you know, if, if you move Bellingham out of the 42nd district, 
I mean, try to find a community of interest. Certainly not put Lake Whatcom in the 39th, though Larry likes that. Um, but I don't know if we actually have our, our curve that we're supposed to be looking at does not always seem to be what happens when the final decisions are made. Because our curve that we were looking at 10 years ago went like this. And we didn't have a curve. We didn't have a bell-shaped curve. So if that bell-shaped curve, we had some kind of parameters for a bell-shaped curve, it would be a way to judge how the districts are being decided where that that curve is a community of interest, and it can be to the right or it can be to the left. But um, just having very safe districts all over the state, I think there's less cooperation than there would be if we had bell-shaped curve districts that lean this way or lean that way. But it's it's uh, partisanship that decides at the very in the very end, and it just and it's where people live and that kind of thing. Not that legislators aren't redistricted out of their district. Sometimes it's a punishment. You know, you're not, <laughs> well, we don't care really. You have to run against another legislator. They did that down in the Edmonds area 10 years ago. So anyway, I think that's, you know, they start out with really good intentions, but look at those maps. There's some of them that are. There is some balance. It's not like one party or the other. No, it's both. No, no, I'm saying it's both, and that's why only three people have to agree, you know, in order to come up with a plan. And it's going to be partisan because they're partisan offices. So I just like to see it be partisan bell-shaped curve instead of partisan split district. That's all. Well, I, in my experience, this is not an American issue. This, is like, this, is, this, this plays out in every democracy. Absolutely. I was just using my soapbox because you asked me. <laughs> hey, Steve. I'm back to precincts. And I'd like Debbie to tell us a little bit more. She's talked to a whole lot about it already, about the criteria that they will probably use to draw the precinct boundaries. There are splits, there are geographic features. But what all kinds of things do you, do you look at? Well, the, the one, those, there were, there were really the four there that I mentioned in terms of, you know, having the, reducing the number of splits if we can, um, because that makes it, um, uh, you know, e I don't mean to say easier on the, the staff, but it does make it less complicated in terms of the number of ballots that people will receive, um, but, and also trying to get the precinct size closer into the 1,000 range. Or the, the, those two would be there, and the fact that they can't cross the boundary lines that were limited by you know what what it requires. So, you know the one the ones that I went over are what we'll mainly be looking at, and then it's just a matter of you know working with the maps and laying them out and seeing what we can do. Because in your reply just now, you didn't mention geographical features like the freeway, the creek, and various other things that kind of inhibit any kind of cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. So those are also criteria. Right. Well, you know, over time it used to be that they would try and follow like geographic areas. I think someone was commenting to me in the days when it used to follow ridge lines and the, the center line of the river and all of that. Well, obviously the river moved on us many times and some of those. So we try to get things that are more directly platted. So in many ways the using, you know, the, the, the you know, streets and the things that are laid out that way, a lot of the, the even on the state ones that we showed, you know, or the recommendations that they're proposing will be along certain, you know, uh, main roads as a divider, for instance. I think one of those that I was looking at when I was trying to look at what is that 39th little finger that's going to come up, for instance, I think it runs along the Mission Road that becomes the Rosser Road or something like that. So many times now, more and more, they're using things that are actually gridded out that we can use as identifiers. So, um, you know, it, it's a very, very complicated process, and like I say, I, uh, this is, a, a, you know, the first um, uh, uh, redistricting that I will have been experiencing. Uh, fortunately, we have somebody like Pete Griffin who writes the legal description and has done it for a long time. Um, I think this is probably the, his second, at least second time that the, he's been involved in the census redistricting and the number of times in between, so he's pretty well versed. And, would be able to give you more of those, but the, those were the general parameters that we tried to identify to say this is where we'll look, and, and it's just looking at the maps. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, 
Yeah, I was going to say, keep in mind that the districts that will be affected, their deadline isn't until later in December. So we really probably won't be heavily focusing on it until end of, end of December. But you're running an election in February. Right. All our school boards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say it's a very common, and they, and you know, they've moved the, the, the filing week earlier, which is why we're, you know, talking about April 30th because all of that got shifted a little bit earlier. So it, it, it just shortened the, the window, but um, we're pretty confident that we can have it done. And you'll all be getting new cards in the mail saying what precinct you're in. <laughs> not, not, maybe not all of you, but I think that we were estimating probably around, somewhere around 60% of the voters will be affected in one way or another. Because even though you may be, as, as Hugh was referring to, you may be geographically in the same house, the number may change around you and suddenly whatever was previously 10 something may now be 111 or 125 or whatever the renumbering will be because we'll have to do the, the renumbering to match. One last comment. As a trained election observer, and there's a number in the room, uh, I'm very much impressed with the auditor's office and what you all have been running as long as I've been here, which is uh, since 2005, uh, excellent. By reputation, one of the best in the state. By right. reputation, our state is one of the best in the country. Mm -hmm. So when you're thankful that you don't live in Texas or Alabama or some of those places, but it's all Florida. very different. Florida. Yes, sir, go ahead. Sorry, you, I'll give you a little uh, political thing here <laughs> that nobody really thinks about much, but when you reorganize your legislative districts, the people that get to vote for the leadership are the PCOs. Now, when legislative districts go across counties, and you have one county that has lots of precincts, and another county that doesn't have as many precincts, mm -hmm. but yet has maybe as much or more population, well, that county gets short shift. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened in Rockland County, Skagit. Skagit has more precincts, uh, Skagit fewer people has per more precinct. Smaller precincts, so they have more PCOs, so they have a little more voting power in the reorganizations than we do. And and this is why I've complained over the years. Within the parties. Okay. Yeah, Joy has been very vocal over a period about precinct size mm -hmm. and keeping them small. Okay. And now, too. Go ahead, sir. So, my understanding of the congressional map is current congressional map runs until the end of 2012. So what's the process in terms of people running? I mean, what's going to happen to Rick Larson, for example? Or more He's on the wrong side of Arlington there. To, to, to our representative. Who's our, who's our congressional representative going to be when that map hasn't been decided? And when do they run? Yeah, if the map is going to change, it's not going to be Rick. When does, when does someone run? When do we find out who's running? Um, and, and how does that whole process work? Because it seems to be a very mm -hmm. odd time frame. Well, I, I think in some cases they run for a district, and that, at, and the parameters are, you know, say currently what the district currently is. If it hasn't been adopted by the time that all gets started, and and they find themselves then being elected and the, the district changes after they've been elected and suddenly their constituency is different. And they have to run two years, in the next two years in the next right. So they, they get elected 
for the old district, even though the old district disappeared. Right. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't live in it, if the line changed after the filing date. I was told that if you guys had changed it, so I wasn't in District 2 anymore, then I would still, if I won the election this year, I would still be representing District 2 for my whole term. Until the next election. Yeah. Because I look at, I mean, I look at Slate Gordon's up here. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge change. And uh, let's say, um, uh, and there's a couple of yeah. yeah. So he lives in Bellingham. So if he runs under the old map, under District 2, gets elected, but District 2 becomes District 10, what happens? You've got a lot of area to cover. <laughs> okay, but, but who, but is he then representing District 10 or is he representing District 2? He would represent Who he would represent him? Because that's where he lives. Because that was, that's the, the district that it was merged into. No, but if he files in, no, okay. if he files in District 2, mm -hmm. then and and District 2 is still there, though. Yeah, and, but when he gets elected, the area that that covered may change his number to 10, but he's, it's still the geographic area that he was elected from. It becomes a much larger geographic area. But Lawson lives in District 2. And if all will still live in District 10 when, if that was the adopted plan? No, if, if Lawson would continue to live in District 2. If, if, we, if, we, if we did Slade Gordon's plan, mm -hmm. either way, Lawson's living in District 2. Mm -hmm. But District 2 would have changed. And Enders would have, been, would have filed, he's living in what is now District 2 becomes District 10. Yeah, confusing. <laughs> Because the other question is, if, if, if Larson and Anders are running in the old District 2, then it splits. Who's elected to District 2? <laughs> well, we, Mr. Thornhite, go ahead. We have added a congressional district. Before somebody can be elected from that district, the district has to be defined. Therefore, nobody can file for that district until it comes into existence. Now, this redistricting at the state level that is going on to create a 10th district has to be completed in time for people to file for that district so they can run in that district in the 2012 election. So Rick Larson's fate will be determined before he files for the 2012 election. Right, right. And he will not get redistricted out. Dennis Kucinich has been redistricted out in Ohio into a district that is currently represented by another Democrat. So he's going to have to, and that's why he was talking about moving to Washington to run in our 10th district. <laughs> you know, just, I don't, but, but um, if the, the census says, or the, the Constitution says that we have to redistrict and balance for the election immediately after the census year. The census year was 2010, the next election is 2012. We have to have all of our congressional redistricting done, finished, in time for people to file for that election. So, so they file first. Everybody who files knows what what the final district boundaries are. The, the, filing, the filing date is, is May 1st. Uh, your, your, your deadline was April 30th. Right. And that is before filing opens. So everything will have been taken care of before filing opens. So we know, we know effectively who we're voting for. Right. We know what it will be. Right. And not only that, we will, and candidates will have a very good idea. I mean, it, it will be. A, a, a map will be released that is going to be very, very close to the final map, so they will know. One of those maps has us, I think it's Huff, has, our, has us in the new 10th district, the congressional district. Yeah. I think there was some talk about the, the maps, at least the, the initial map of the, of the four deciding together will probably be available in November. Yes. And so then, like you say, you'll, you'll definitely have but, the, but that commission has to have completed its work by midnight on December 31st. And, and then the legislature has a chance to do what the it legislature does. The legislature can tweak up to, I believe it's 2%. 2%, yes. Um, 
but the, the real horse trading is going to take part, take place um, after supper on December 31st. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think what Luann was saying about the, there'll be a general map, and they won't be arguing about every single congressional district or every single legislative district, so there'll be a lot of certainty <laughs> from that yeah. first map, but there will be areas, and I think ours is one of them, that will probably have to kind of wait till the end to get decided. Myra, <coughs> you said there was a moment when it looked as if you weren't going to be able to come to agreement on a single plan. What if those guys can't get three votes? Well, if they don't, it, it goes, goes to, to the It goes to the uh, Supreme Court. The state Supreme and, Court. And and the, the political parties are not going to want to let the Supreme Court be deciding. No. So they will come to an agreement before, um, they, before they lose their power. Okay, now's your last chance to have this wonderful panel answer any questions you have. <laughs> Those questions you didn't want to ask or afraid to ask, go ahead. One little one. The map, the map you've got there ends in the sort of light ball square. Mm -hmm. Is that, can you explain, does that continue all the way to the White County Eastern boundary? Or? No. Oh, the, the, the districts. The, this little orange block that you're asking about here. Well, it, it, your orange and your green yes. don't extend the white. The answer, I believe, is yes. Yeah, they go out to the. There, there are essentially no people there. Right. There's no okay. people, at, but it, you're right. It, you know, it would follow out to the county line. line. Because yeah. in District 1, the people in the Halo, where the dams are on, on Highway 20, are part of District 1. So they would have to go out to the county line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank to keep uh, all districts population equal, then you should really have had all the uh, impact fees equal throughout the county and wouldn't have the rapid growth in one area. <laughs> Everybody can see me. Okay, well, a hand of applause for our panel. Thank you very much, and we're adjourned now.